зараз вже можна We can now say that Russian forces have started the battle of the Donbass for which they have long prepared. The Ukraine conflict heats up with attention now focused on the east. Hello, I'm Arnold Nader and this is the heat. Russia has launched a new military campaign which it says has the goal of restoring peace in the eastern part of Ukraine. Ukraine and Russian-backed separatists have been in a battle over the Donbass region for the last eight years. CGTN's Philip Krather has the latest from Lviv. Both Russia and Ukraine agree on this point that the new phase in this war has now begun. The Pentagon, though, saying that these are just the preparatory stages of a bigger offensive to come. But the effects are already seen on the ground. Our colleagues from the Associated Press uh, seeing, uh, for example, a Russian attack on a residential area in Kharkiv. That's nothing new. It's just been going on since the very start of the war. And then Kramatorsk, uh, more colleagues there, uh, they saw an explosion and also saw at least one person who died as a result of that explosion. Kramatorsk is a very important city to be looked at over the next few days and weeks because that is not yet under control of Russian forces. They would like to get it under control to be able to say maybe further along the line that they have achieved this goal of controlling the whole of the Donbass region. The attacks from Russia have been increasing. Uh, Moscow says it itself that there have, has been an increase in missile strikes. There has been an, an increase in shelling as well in the likes of Kharkiv, but also in other cities, not in that Donbass region that Russia wants to get under its control, just outside the likes of Dnipro and Zaporizhia, potentially very important cities for Russia, maybe even to get under their control in the future. In Mariupol, in the meantime, in the southeast, not much has changed except that what we see from the ground is very limited because it's so difficult to get our own eyes on the ground. Ukrainian soldiers still holding out, still being bombed by Russian forces, and that city still not in the control of the Russian forces. Philip Crowther, CGTN in Lviv, Ukraine. There is much to talk about. Let's get to our panel. Author and historian Marcus Papadopoulos focuses on Russia and the former USSR. Michael O'Hanlon is a senior fellow and research director in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution. Also with us is Ulrich Bruckner. He's a European studies professor at Stanford University in Berlin. And Alexei Rabchin is an advisor to the Deputy Prime Minister for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration of Ukraine. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And Alexei, let me start with you. In Ukraine, as we've been reporting, a new phase of the war has started. Russia is saying that it's hit hundreds of targets. Here is the Russian Defense Ministry spokesman talking earlier on Tuesday. Let's listen. The Russian army is fulfilling the tasks set by the Supreme Commander-in-Chief in the course of a special military operation. We are gradually implementing our plan to liberate the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics and taking measures to restore peaceful life. The United States and Western states under its control are doing everything to drag out the military operation for as long as possible. The growing volume of foreign weapons supply graphically demonstrates their intention to provoke the Kiev regime to fight to the last Ukrainian. So, Alexei, that was the Russian uh, defense minister, and we have a situation now where the battle has intensified. Uh, talks to try and resolve this. Diplomatic negotiations have stalled. In fact, the Russians say that they've hit a dead end. So where do you see this going? Well, I see that the Battle of Donbass has started, as our president has said, that Russia had the reinforcements, and they're trying to, to basically implement the Putin's plan. Uh, and uh, the both sides are now engaged in a severe battles, uh, and like a lot of reporting from, from the battlefront. But I would say that, like, uh, like Russian soldiers are fighting only some, for some Putin ideas to become, you know, famous as Russian tsars, you know, collecting some territories and uh, restoring the empire, while Ukrainians are fighting for, for its independence, for, for their territory. We have, like, much more morale, and, like, Russians are not understand, like, for what they are fighting for. And basically we have a third side, which is the, let's put it, like, collective West, 
which is now providing a much more sophisticated weapon, like including artillery, and as we heard today from the US department, even planes. So we anticipate uh, that the battle for Donbass will be won by, uh, by Ukrainians, and this will end the Putin aggression. So do you believe, Alexei, that this conflict will be resolved militarily on the battlefield? Uh, as uh, yet, we see that Russians are like not negotiable. So, and you know, honestly, saying like after what we saw in Bucha, this massacre, this atrocity in the liberated areas, and I really afraid to see what will be in other liberated uh, areas, which is now uh, temporarily occupied. And after the severe, you know, in, in, like damaging the like Mariupol, the city with, where I have born, basically it's like the city is not recognizable. They're bombing civilians, kids. Like I have some friends who is just like I don't know what what's happening with them because they're not responding to the phone. And like after this, like it's really hard to negotiate any diplomacy. And now yeah. we see that like any negotiation will be only after the battle for Donbas. Michael O'Hanlon, uh, this new offensive by the Russians, it's been called the defining battles of this conflict. Here is the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky. Let's listen to what he had to say. Our grouping that is located in Donbass is one of the best military we have. It is a large grouping, and Russia wants to encircle them and destroy them. It is nearly 40,000 people. This battle, and it can happen, so there will be several battles, and we don't know how long it is going to take, it can influence the course of the whole war. It doesn't mean if they are able to capture Donbass, they won't come further towards Kyiv. That is why, for us, this battle is very important for many reasons. It is very important to win this battle. So, Michael, as I said, the diplomatic efforts to try and resolve this have completely stalled. And as we've just heard, the Ukrainians believe that this can be resolved on the battlefield, that they will prevail uh, on the battlefield. Do you think that is the case? I don't know. My heart is certainly with the Ukrainian cause. I admire them, as do many in the West, if not virtually everyone that I know. But I feel that the military dynamics are complex and hard to foresee. And I can at least imagine maybe at least three distinct possibilities, if I could very briefly mention each. One is that Russia makes a certain amount of progress, uh, but has to do so with great difficulty. Perhaps the terrain in the east uh, allows for a little more progress than towards Kyiv. But nonetheless, every square inch that Russia obtains is uh, exhausting its forces. And therefore, you begin to see a sort of a quasi-stable situation emerge in the next few weeks where Russia holds parts of the east, south and southeast, and that famous land corridor to Crimea, but not perhaps with much more than that. A second possibility is that R Russia would be decisively defeated. I think that is a long shot, but I admire my Ukrainian friend and colleague who expects and hopes for that outcome. Um, it, it is possible, if, especially if Russian forces have to stick to the roads because of weather conditions and, and so forth. It's possible they will simply be stymied. But a third possibility is that they will, in fact, complete this encirclement. And I'm glad we have an historian on the call because, of course, a lot of the, the big battles of World War II and other wars in history in this part of the world were about attempted encirclement, the goal being to not only take territory, but to annihilate the enemy by cutting them off from any path for retreat or supply. And to the extent that Ukraine's best forces are encircled in the east, it could then set up the possibility for Russia, after it completes its operations in the east, to turn westward again towards Kyiv and maybe even marching through the center of the country. I do not know how to allocate probabilities for those three scenarios. And there may even be possibilities I haven't thought of. So, no, I do not have a clear prediction. Marcus Papadopoulos, you are the historian on the panel right now. What do you make of the current situation? Well, I think it's very important to say that from day one of the Russian military campaign in Ukraine, Russia has been winning. Indeed, contrary to proclamations by Western governments and Western mainstream media outlets, the Ukrainian army today is virtually paralyzed as a result of the sustained and potent Russian military attacks which it has sustained. The Ukrainian army, as I speak, is in no position whatsoever to launch 
a major offensive of its own or a major counteroffensive. The Ukrainian army is able, however, to initiate hit and run operations mm -hmm. against the Russian army. And Ukrainian special forces are also able to undertake such actions. But that is really it. And I think that one of the problems as to why the West has completely um, underestimated and misunderstood the Russian military campaign is because the way that the West and Russia prosecutes war is very different. So the Russian military in Ukraine yeah. is um, employing a Soviet military strategy known as cauldrons, whereby enemy formations which have embedded themselves in cities are surrounded with a ring of steel. And then the army which has um, implemented that ring of steel yeah. then presses on to capture more and more land. And, that, that, and then at some point later on, that uh, ring of steel will be the focus of the army. So it is very clear to me All that, right. the, All right. that the crisis in Ukraine will be decided on the battlefield. OK, Marcus, can I... Can I interrupt you very quickly? And if you could be brief, please. And you may say, when you say Russia is winning, why did Russia withdraw its troops from the more central part of Ukraine? And that happened over the past few weeks. We've also heard the Russians telling us that they've lost vast amounts of troops in this battle. They've just lost a battleship in the Black Sea. Well, first of all, Rush, the Russian army control uh, an area of land in uh, Ukraine which is nearly the size of the United Kingdom. It's certainly bigger than England and Wales combined, right. from Kharkov all the way through to the Donbass, to Zaporozhia, and into Kherson. Yeah. Secondly, uh, the West <coughs> somehow knew the Russian battle plans. They were under the impression that Russia expected a lightning, a, a lightning victory and that the Russian army was going to enter Kiev within a few days. Right. Well, I do not believe that the Russian high command ever believed that they would achieve a lightning victory. Why? Because for the last eight years, the Ukrainian yeah. armed forces have been trained and equipped by NATO and to NATO standards. And as regards to the Moskva uh, vessel, which uh, sunk in the Black Sea last week. Yeah. Yes, that was a major source of embarrassment and humiliation, not just for the Russian Navy, but for Russia as a whole. Yeah. However, that loss uh, has not and will not have an adverse effect on the Russian military campaign in okay. Ukraine. All right, uh, Ulrich Bruckner, I want to look at the war and the impact it's having in other parts of Europe. Uh, there have been various predictions on when this war would end. Uh, some people say it could end in a few weeks. Others, like the U.S. Secretary of State, say that this could go on until the end of the year. And we are already seeing the impact right now. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, can Europe uh, and the world, for that matter, tolerate this war uh, going on for so long. We've already had the IMF telling us that the growth prediction for this year has been downgraded. Supply chains have been hit. We've seen inflation going up in many countries. A number of developing countries around the world are soon going to be seeing the impact of the fact that they won't be getting imports of food from Ukraine and Russia. Well, if you're saying we cannot tolerate this as the West, then what do you mean by that? Is it that we should go to war and end it because we have 30 times the economy size compared with Russia, or we have more nukes. The reason why the West didn't do anything more than providing weapons and providing more weapons and providing more money is that it doesn't want to take the risk of an escalation that this turns into World War III and the end of the human species on this planet. Mm. So for the time being, it was a de-escalation in some sort of a absurd sort of counter reaction in providing more to make this war last longer, mm. while in fact the intention was the opposite. But I must also confess that I belong to the Western people who misunderstand what the strategy of the Russian army and Putin is. 
because when I understood in the beginning that this was about fighting the West or fighting the United States and not about territory, I hear now from my colleague that it was such a smart strategy to occupy territory that is larger than Wales and England combined. I never understood that this was all about territory and this territory will not be protected and, and controlled forever and therefore I don't believe in a military solution. This will maybe be the end of a battle, but it's certainly not the end of the war. So where do you see it? So where do you see it? I don't really see how it could possibly end for more than the end of that battle. What we see now is that Putin urgently needs to get a trophy that he presents on right. the 9th of right. May for the parade. And if he doesn't bring anything home, then people start scratching their heads and ask, what is happening there? There is no regime change. There is no falling Nazi regime with a Jew on top of it. There is no chance to occupy a large territory like Ukraine with a relatively small army. Yeah. NATO is yeah. not divided. NATO is expanding. The European Union is getting appetite to get more countries in. Mm -hmm. Neutral countries are applying for NATO membership. The whole thing is a mess depending on how it was defined in the first place what Putin didn't want to see happening. And he got exactly the opposite. And in return, he gets territory of an old industry space that cost him seven billion before the war started. Right. And it will right. cost much more and he cannot control it. All right. Alexei, you know, we've just been listening to a whole range of scenarios of what could happen in Ukraine. Um, from what you've been hearing from our panelists there, what do you make of it? Uh, I, of course, I would like to respond to what the notable gentleman said about the Russia is winning the war. Mm. Now, just repeating the Russian propaganda uh, and trying to to disguise that uh, you know Russia lost like around like eight generals for 40 days. Mm. Russia lost their flagman, like which covers the basically the sea with the with the protection. It means that their other fleets are now vulnerable for like more attacks, and we do hope that the the uh, the uh, anti air uh, anti ship missiles that we will receive will hit more ships that are now terrorizing like uh, the whole of Ukraine with the air uh, alarm. Uh, and like of course, like Russia's success to eliminate it, to destroy Mariupol, which is like more, more than like one uh, one half of a million inhabitants. Eliminating three like bigger, bigger like Ukrainian uh, plants and killing like more than 20,000 civilians. Is this a win? Like, and how they will co get control over the territory? They will receive the corridor through Crimea to Russia for what? You know, this is a ridiculous war, and this is a like a ridiculous uh, scenario that is being described. Yeah. And like, we do believe in our army. Of course, we are fighting with 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 a butcher who is sending their people to death, yeah. and they don't know what they are fighting for. So I would I would just like like very like like try to be calm and not trying to respond to this propaganda. Of course, like it's it's hard situation, but like I All right. have no doubt that we will win. All right. Michael O'Hanlon, you know, uh, as we've been reporting earlier on, this is a new phase of the war that we are seeing right now. What do you believe is Russia's ultimate strategic goal? Well, this gets to the disagreement that my fellow panelists are having with each other, uh, because I think that, in a way, everyone's right. <laughs> Certainly, Russia's original goal was a rapid, decisive win that would overthrow the Zelensky government. They had become infatuated with their new weaponry with some kind of a shock and awe, if you will, a campaign that sort of analogous to the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, where we made the mistake of thinking that it would be fast and easy. Putin also felt the same way, and he was expecting, I believe, to be able to overthrow the government and perhaps annex much or all of the country. However, whatever his maximalist ambitions were, he has not been able to realize those. He has suffered many tactical defeats. My Ukrainian friend and my friend in Berlin are unambiguously correct about that. However, unfortunately, in my opinion, Russia still has some plausible backup plans, which are not quite as grandiose, uh, but they could entail establishing this infamous land corridor mm -hmm. from Western Russia through the Donbass, through Mariupol, over to Crimea, possibly expanding it, possibly even uh, aspiring to Odessa, 
which would be a tragedy, even above all the tragedies that have already occurred, and with the possibility of rearming and someday trying a more wholesome attack against the whole country of Ukraine yet again. And so I don't think we can rule out the possibility that Russia has some ambitions that are within its reach, or at least potential reach. Mm. And over the longer term, it may return to the maximalist ambitions as well. Bottom line, we just don't really know what is in Putin's head. And um, uh, we, we do know that he's going to, I think in the short term, try to establish these successes in the east, southeast, and south. After that, all bets are off. Marcus Papadopoulos, at what point does Russia say, look, we've achieved what we set out to do, the war stops now? Well, I believe the primary reason as to why Russia launched a military campaign in Ukraine was to prevent Ukraine from joining NATO, because a Ukraine in NATO would have seen the Russian Federation completely encircled on its western border by NATO member states, from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. And in that scenario, Russian naval supremacy in the Black Sea would have been uh, challenged because the Americans uh, in the last few years had started to uh, refurbish the ports at Odessa and Ochakov to accommodate American warships. So I believe that preventing NATO from becoming, uh, preventing Ukraine from becoming a NATO member was the reason as to why the Kremlin sent the Russian army into Ukraine. But I believe that the uh, Kremlin is looking to secure the entire left bank of the Dnipro River. And then after that, yeah. the Kremlin will say, in, in so many words, that the ball is in the court of Kiev, or to be more accurate, the ball is in the court of Washington. If the rest of Ukraine on the right bank of the Dnieper yeah. uh, persists in wanting to join NATO, then I do suspect the Russian military will prosecute a war on the right side of the Dnieper. Right. I would very likely, I would very, very quickly like to respond to the guest in Kiev. Yeah. Democracy is partly about respecting other people's opinion and tolerating diversity of opinion. Because I hold a view given that I um, am a doctor of Russian history, because I hold a view which you disagree with, does not mean you have the right to label my opinion as Russian propaganda and to denigrate me as a Rus Russian propagandist. That is not what democracy is about. I respect your opinion. I disagree with it, but I respect it. I would appreciate it if you could extend the same courtesy to me and respect my opinion. Okay, Marcus, I want to get on to something else. You know, earlier we heard the Russian Defense Minister uh, talk about the increasing amounts of weapons that the West is pouring into Ukraine and the impact that that is having on prolonging the war. Uh, but we have a different view as well. Uh, here's what the European Union spokesman had to say. Let's listen to him. The war can stop today if Russia decides that it should stop. It has nothing to do with the arms deliveries to Ukraine. Ukraine is only defending itself. Uh, the war will stop the day Russia decides to stop it. Um, and uh, therefore, to make the link between these two is actually something that, uh, you know, the Russians are trying uh, to establish. But that's not the link that should be made. The link is uh, the willingness of Russia to continue its aggression against uh, Ukraine. So, Marcus, there we have it. The European Union says, look, the cards are in Russia's hands. They can stop this war if they want to. Well, the European Union is, of course, not an impartial party. The European Union has been working in unison with NATO against Russia, against yeah. Russian national security for many years now. But, yes, there is truth in what the EU spokesperson said just now. If the Russian military was to completely halt its campaign in Ukraine, then the war would come to an end. But at the same time, Ukraine, or again, more accurately, America, <laughs> has to put into writing that Ukraine will never be admitted into the Western military bloc. That is the crux of the matter. I have been saying for nearly 15 years that the day could come that if Russia feels it is compelled to take action, military action in Ukraine, then it would do that. And I believe that NATO um, re or America, being the de facto leader of NATO, could also bring this war to an end. 
by saying to the Kremlin, we hereby put into writing that Ukraine yeah. will never be admitted into NATO. And then we would see what the response of the Kremlin would be to that. OK. Ulrich Bruckner, do you think we would see that day when countries like the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, sign a document that says that Ukraine will never be a part of the Western Defense Alliance, of NATO? Well, if it would be that simple, we could have done this last year and we could have done it without any shots and any military action. In fact, there is only a diplomatic solution and with or without the war, one has to sit down and find a way how to balance the security concerns on both sides. Mm -hmm. What we see now is a total mess and I don't really see how the battles that we have just seen starting will lead to a solution. Because what has been said about the different scenarios, mm -hmm. it is only under the conditions that nothing is happening in the West or nothing is happening in terms of escalation in the situation in Russia, how the sanctions hit the economy in Russia, and then time is not on the side of Russia to occupy space. This sounds so 20th century yeah. that we fight, someone fights wars yeah. over a piece of land. In what kind of world are we living? Alexei Rubchin, I've only got about a minute left, but President Zelensky has said that he cannot give any kind of a guarantee that the Russians would not again try to attack Kyiv uh, if they secure Donbass. You are in Kyiv right now. What are you seeing? Are there any kinds of preparations being made uh, for the possibility of another attack? Yes, people all over Ukraine are feel insecure because of the air alarm every single day. And we know that uh, Putin might attack Kyiv. But like myself, as a as a used to be the member of parliament, as a politician, as a PhD in international economy, I know how to how to do a proper debate. But as a person, which nation is suffering a major death and a war? I will labor a Russian propagandist as Russian propagandist, the person who is repeatedly doing the Russian uh, narratives. And it's not about NATO. Like when I was a member of parliament of previous con con convocation, with this finger, I voted to uh, Euro integration and Euro Atlantic integration to be in our constitution. And it's not about the NATO or Russian language or protecting the Russian speaking. It's about destroying Ukraine as a state. This is the what Putin desire, and this is kind of an atrocity he is doing right. Okay. All right. We are going to have to leave it there. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.